I look forward to this particular series greatly because God sent it to me, is making me do it, or I should say he presented it to me and he allows me the choice to make a decision whether or not I want to participate in doing this as part of the video ministry or to just sidestep it and be on the safe and narrow, you know, the place where you can avoid certain topics or issues or realities that confront you in your face. Kind of like what I had to do with John MacArthur because I have no problem sometimes with what he teaches at times. But there are times where he said things and does things that I have a problem with that I will confront directly and state to you. When men of God say something stupid, it doesn't make them less a man of God, it just makes them a stupid man of God. That they said something stupid. And so they were stupid about it. And they went out of their way to make themselves dumb and look dumber by presenting it in the internet, on the ministry, as a video, and to claim things against someone that can only be slanderous and libellious in the way that they presented it and the way that they personified it and the way that they continue to do it. And that's why God wants me to say, hey, guess what? You know, I don't have a problem with things that the man teaches. I have the problem with what the man preaches sometimes against Billy Graham or against certain people that he doesn't agree with that are more well known than he is, that are possibly more popular than he is. That may have, have a larger ministry than he does. And now, because he's not in that exalted place, he's now come out of his shell to make direct attacks on personalities and people that God has used in their life. And so, God brought this into my life on purpose for a design to say, hey, look, you can disagree with somebody that's in the ministry. I mean, I have no problem with saying, hey, you know, I love Greg Glory because I got saved in Greg Glory's ministry. I didn't get taught in Greg Glory's ministry. I went to Calvary for that. Greg Glory is a dynamic man of God. He's a person God uses in evangelism and to preach the gospel and to use that in a daily way to present to the people that would receive it great teaching. And there's some people that are ministered by his teaching. I don't get anything out of it. But when I go somewhere else, I am. I'm blessed. And when I go to crusades or when I listen to different things at times, you know, I'm enjoying Greg. Greg's a neat guy. But like any man of God, I know he's learning as we all are learning. And so if Greg makes a mistake or does something that I don't agree with, it doesn't mean I'm right and he's wrong. It means that the possibility of there being an error is just something that we all should examine for ourselves. When someone makes a belligerent, stupid statement, though, as John MacArthur has against Billy Graham, I have no problem reminding him, hey, you touch God's anointed, be careful that your own anointing doesn't get in conflict with becoming a Saul rather than a Paul. And Saul, David, was chosen as the anointed one when Saul should have remained as king and could have been blessed to the end of his days. And I pray that John MacArthur may be blessed to the end of his days, but I pray that he shuts up about Billy Graham and quits talking about certain men of God that are not what he claims they are, whether it be a Rick Warren or anybody else, that if God hasn't told him to say it, he needs to shut up and quit preaching it. No offense to him. But every offense that he's made against men of God that I know that God has anointed, I will state and say, hey, no, wrong, I disagree. You can have your perspective and present it as a personal point of view. And I have no problem if you would do that. But when you come out and teach and preach and talk against men of God as though they were not from God, then I will stand against you. So God brought this particular wonderful devotional. I mean, I'm assuming it's wonderful because I haven't read it yet. But we're going to go through this devotional because God wants to put it in my face to show you how grace can still apply to people I adamantly disagree with as far as their teaching may be concerned or as far as some point of view they may have. But at the same time, I can support what they're doing in the ministry because they preach the gospel. I see that with possibly you know Osteen who may have an inherited a ministry that he has no clue what he's doing. But in some ways, maybe God's using anyways. So if people get saved in Osteen's ministry, God bless them. You know, if, he's, if you're trying to learn from Joel Osteen's ministry, I'd tell you to go somewhere else. But if you're just going to be, you know, given some encouragement, hey, 
God can use anything and anyone at any point in time, including people like John MacArthur, including you, and including me. So let's look at the Word of God today, as we know that it's not John MacArthur teaching us, but it's the Spirit of God that dwells within us who causes us to be enlightened by the Word, to be taught by the Word, and to be encouraged by the Word. So today, as we read the title and we try to apply it to our lives, it's called Integrity Triumphs Under Fire. I hate the word integrity because I already know. Show me a man of integrity and I'll show you a sinner saved by grace. Period. Because integrity is one of those things that you're supposed to reach for but you'll never attain because you are a sinner. And you'll sin just as easy as anybody else you'll fall into. So you need to learn grace and mercy. But we're going to stick with the title. Integrity Triumphs Under Fire. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Daniel 3, 21, 23. I have no idea what version that is of the Bible, but God bless them anyways. When God doesn't deliver you from a trial, He refines you through the trial. When facing excommunication at the Diet of Worms, Martin Luther wrote to the elector, Frederick. We'll let that go by, because we're singing... <laughs> I almost feel like it's appropriate, but we're not going to go there because I'm trying to be very attuned to the things of the Spirit and not of the flesh. We'll talk a little louder and hopefully it'll carry over because I believe that he stopped. So, when facing excommunication at the Diet of Worms, Martin Luther wrote to Elector Frederick, you ask me what I shall do if I am called by the emperor. I will go down if I am too sick to stand on my feet. If Caesar calls me, God calls me. If violence is used, as well it may be, I commend my cause to God. He lives and reigns who saved the three youths from the fiery furnace of the king of Babylon. And if he will not save me, my head is worth nothing compared with Christ. This is no time to think of safety. I must take care that the gospel is not brought into contempt by our fear to confess and seal our teaching with our own blood and life. Luther was willing to risk even death for the sake of Christ. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him, he valued integrity above his own life. He valued the word of God more than he valued his life before God. And in his loneliest hour drew encouragement from their experience. Often we pray to avoid trials when God wants to use them for our greater good. But trials test the genuineness of our faith and purge us of sin and shallowness like a refiner's fire purges gold. The process may be painful, but the result is more precious than purest gold. 1 Peter 1.7 Suggestions for prayer state that pray that you might face each trial with wisdom, with patience, and a clean sense or a clear sense of the Lord's presence with you. And for further study, read Acts 20, 22, 24. What was the Apostle Paul's perspective on the persecution that awaited him in Jerusalem? What was his ultimate goal? And so, you know, I look at this and I think, what a wonderful testimony that Luther had and the children of Israel in Daniel, Shadrach, and Dan and Dan, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the sense that even though God may slay us, we can trust Him. Even though God may take us into a trial, we can trust Him. Even though it may require our death, we can trust Him. Because whether we live or whether we die, we live or die unto the Lord. And so in all of that, we can have the reality of our faith by living what we say we believe. Let our words be few, Jesus said, but let them be things that we do. For if we used but few words and hung on to them as though they were precious gold, then maybe we would do more of what we say we are than just say what we should do and we don't do. 
There's often a tendency in evangelical Christianity to cover our failures with grace and forgiveness. To go on because we're extended mercy without the reality of saying, hey, I need to stop saying it unless I'm doing it. I need to stop preaching it unless that teaching is a part of my life and I'm learning it and applying it to my life. When we choose to use certain words, we need to make sure that they are a part of us, that they live in us, that they breathe life of experiences we've gone through in them, so that they would not come back to convict us, but that through the trying of our faith, we will have been produced patience in us, that we will not teach those things except that we have learned them firsthand from knowing God and going through those trials and tribulations that make the Word of God real in our life. What you don't know, don't say. What you haven't experienced, don't teach. What you haven't lived, don't try to tell someone else about. Because if you do, you may find yourself a fool in his folly, rather than someone who's giving up the glorious gospel and the God who will deliver us or allow us to perish, but still use our life as a testimony. If we are living the life we say we are giving the teaching thereof by our word and by our testimony and by our loving not our life even unto death and by the blood of the Lamb that we shed for us. Let our ministry be that truthful and that reality as I've said that video must be because if you see or hear something here that isn't true or applicable to that life with which I'm living then I will stop video and quit immediately because what you see is what you get who I am is what I am and that's why I can say to this man that you know we've read the word that God has given us through the testimony of the devotion this afternoon to consider our ways and to think on these things and to apply that which is good and reject that which is wrong or apply that which is only profitable to our own personal experience but at the same time not set ourselves up for a fall as possibly this man may have done at one time and I pray that today he has changed his ways even as I continue to pray for him every day for you see it's not the question of whether we will or we have gone through trials the question is have we learned from those trials and tribulations we're going through to be able to stand with the children of Israel and say yea when I stood for God God delivered me and even had he not I still to this day would have said Though he slay me, yet shall I praise him. Whether he delivers me or not, you shall know, O Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven. And that is the reality. I think Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. I had to think about that. And so, when we live out what we're about, in other words, when we divulge our life's experiences in this learning process make sure when you say something that's an opinion it's an opinion make sure what you've lived is what you give and make sure what you're saying is what has been made real in your life through the trials and tribulations that God has made it and tested it by fire that proves you and proves and approves that with which you're teaching others to be like for then we find that we can take that which is being said as the Word of God and it will accomplish its purpose in us to change us and make us into the image of the incorruptible Son of God that we are all growing up to become likened unto. And I pray that for you, that today, instead of integrity, I pray that you may be full of the grace that God has given you to live the way that God intends for you to be. Whether a man lifted up high or a man brought low whether in success or whether in recess of that with which position you thought you were or whether to some extreme you've gone to one or the other I pray you may find in all of those things God loves you God is with you and God is for you for the Lord our God in the midst of you is mighty and he will rejoice over you with love and he will perform that which concerns you even to the bringing before you to his father with exceeding joy and presenting you faultless with joy and rejoicing because it is a work that God has done even as he's done and given for us for today 
his strength. In Jesus' name, amen.